My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Apocalypse, I said, why you want to show up now? Just when the heart of my life was getting good. I'll give you one more chance. Walk on out of the door, yeah. Get your ass to getting where the getting is good. Good morrow, Eumenidites. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater bringing you another episode of Euripides, Eumenides, a theater history podcast. Loyal listeners, I find myself in something of a quandary as I have been burdened with the particular circumstance known as life. Okay, I'll quit being dramatic about it. Over the last few weeks, I've just been very fortunate to be quite busy personally and professionally, so I haven't been able to conduct the research and writing, much less the recording and editing of a new episode this time around. But to keep consistently releasing an episode every two weeks, I feel like I owe you something. However, this does give me the opportunity to revisit some of my favorite topics that I've covered before, and I truly love the episode I'm replaying for you this time around. The topic of censorship has been discussed many times on this show, and this moment in theater history is just so delightfully obnoxious and frankly embarrassing for one Mr. Anthony Comstock, a man so obsessed with the prevention of the proliferation of lascivious materials that he actually fought to be a U.S. postal inspector and was granted unforeseen powers for someone in that position. This particular episode is about his problems with a specific George Bernard Shaw play. And hey, you know what? Maybe that will be episode 100. I have been meaning to get a more in-depth look at Shaw sometime. Maybe not. I don't know. But for now, I'll reintroduce you to my friend Dan Poslins. Dan lives and works in the Seattle area and has been very prolific in the fringe circuits of the Seattle theater scene. And his contributions to the Seattle improv world are pretty impressive as well. But without further ado, here is the replay of the episode Dan and I recorded and released in October 2022, Comstockery. I think one of my favorite things I ever saw you do, and I used to teach this in acting classes or just tell people like, your posture, your silhouette tells a lot. And I remember we were at a rehearsal once and um, we were just, you know, getting ready to go on stage and you were, I don't want to say flopping around, but kind of like contorting yourself into different motions and everything. And then when, whenever they said go, whatever position you were in, that was your character. So <laughs> it could have been like a hunchback or you could have had your belly extended out and you that that was how that was what led your character that day I thought that was amazing oh that wow thank you I I don't actually remember that but now that you say that <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm going to steal that from myself because there you go yeah that's like a, a really great trick to uh, just get into a scene credit trademark Dan Poslitz right yeah. there awesome <laughs> So, Dan, we've been reconnecting here a little bit, and it sounds like post-pandemic in Seattle, which still is uh, almost a foreign term, um, I think, as you put it, nobody told COVID that it's over. But it sounds like you've had a couple really uh, cool things happen. You had a dream role come up that you got. I did. I got to play the baker in Into the Woods, which, oh, man. you know, ever since I was, uh, I think, a teenager when I first saw the... Uh, the original Broadway recording that they Ooh, yeah. uh, they did for PBS. Uh, I've been obsessed with that show and that role, uh, and getting to play it. And this is a community theater, you know, that which is pretty much the level it would take for anyone to cast me in it. 
Uh, well, but still, that's quite an undertaking for a community theater. I mean, it's a Sondheim musical. That's complex stuff. It's it's an, it's a huge show to put on. It's a uh, it's deceptively complicated, right? Uh, and it was a, it was a real dream for me to get to do the role, you know, in front of people who couldn't leave without it being impolite. So, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. essentially trapped there. <laughs> uh, what you call a captive audience exactly <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome so one of the other things i saw though that you had was like something of a uh risque uh like reading of you know some uh, television shows or something like that was that what i was seeing oh <laughs> so uh, a, a f- friend of mine uh, who I do improv with at uh, Unexpected Productions, where we do uh, theater sports in Seattle. We we love Breaking Bad and we love Bre- Better Call Saul. And there's there's sort of like a group of us who were constantly talking about the shows. And so uh, we were all talking about it in earnest. Uh, and she decided to direct a one-off show, basically an improv show in the style of uh, Vince Gilligan shows, uh, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and whatnot. Uh, oh my God! So very, yeah. very average, everyday people finding themselves in incredibly gritty situations. Is, is in gritty situations, to... in basically in situations that called for them to sort of go either outside of the law or to behave in in ethically gray ways. Part of the whole challenge of it was how to even capture that whole oeuvre in an improv show. Oh, uh, and right. I, I think oh my we, God. Well, I think we did a, an okay job of it. Uh, we certainly had fun doing it, which was our main concern. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, well, the audience, uh, they, they, they all seem to enjoy it. <laughs> From what we See, there you tell. go. Okay. Yeah. And I, sh- I should say that that has been kind of like your primary stamp on the Seattle theater scene is you have been a longtime member of Unexpected Productions, uh, which mm. runs like the theater sports games. They have several different uh, long running shows. And I think isn't theater sports like doesn't it still hold some record on the West Coast or something like that? I mean, we, we are the longest running uh, live show, I believe, in Seattle. Wow. And yeah, it's a, we're, I, I want to say we're coming up on 40 years. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's uh, right. Oh my gosh, that is, that's outstanding. And so for those of you who uh, have been to Seattle or you have seen all of your friends tour Seattle, uh, they are the theater behind the gum wall. <laughs> and we're actually like tucked away inside the gum wall. So yeah. just pull your nose to the, mm-hmm putrid smell of gum <laughs> festering for years out in the the hot August sun and <laughs> venture inside and come see theater sports, which is a Seattle institution. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back to your Vince Gilligan thing of ethically gray, questionable content. And I have a question for you because I usually start these shows with a question. And I mean, I don't mean to catch you off guard, but then again, you are an improv. So I have a feeling you might be able to handle this with aplomb. The question I have for you is, do you have a favorite play or musical that has been censored or banned? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I I was thinking about that earlier. Oh, no kidding. well, the, the funny thing is, you know, be, because you ask me that and I, my instinct is to say, well, I don't think any show that I've ever done or was interested in or cared too much about ever was banned. Oh, okay. But then if I actually look into it, it turns out, oh, almost every show <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've never cared for, you know, there was someone somewhere who decided we weren't going to do this. Yeah, some uh, uh, purveyor of purity, as it were. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I guess part of that is I'm maybe a little inured to just how, uh, you know, you you used the word risque earlier, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I I suppose I look at a lot of the works that I love as being rather tame, uh, <laughs> my standards. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. You know, but that, but then I think about something like the producers, and oh yeah, you know, they are actually marching around with swastikas and, and raising their hands, and yeah. Uh-huh. There's, I, I could understand people uh, not taking kindly to that. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. And, you know, it was so funny. Uh, a few years ago, that was done here in my hometown of Sheridan, Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And uh, on the on the playbill the next year, they took a cast photo at the end of it after the, you know, final big number. And it looked nice because it's like, oh, here's the big cast and all their costumes up against the set. And that's that's what theater looks like. Right. And then you have like four or five Nazi soldiers on the right hand side of the picture with their swastika armbands on. And that was the playbill image for the entire season. (laughs) Well, I hope everybody saw that show last year and knows that we're not just uh, promoting, uh, you know, Nazi works. That may have been. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, that's a show that holds a lot of importance to me in part because uh, I was actually directing a production of it that got canceled. Oh, that's right. Because of COVID. I would say the wounds from that are still scarring over uh, years later now. So I, I have a similar situation with Into the Woods, funny enough. Um, yeah. I, I will say that we, uh, you know, my production of Into the Woods that I did just recently, you know, was definitely on the tail end of COVID. Again, you know, big asterisk on tail end of COVID there. Right. <laughs> tail, end, tail end, I should say, of the the sort of, I, I guess, the current trend line for uh, COVID. Mm. And I was... I was close to panicking leading up to Tech Week. We'd already had uh, several people have to call out of multiple rehearsals because they come down with it. We were all masking during rehearsal and whatnot, but the odds that all of us would actually make it through to opening. And I I was, I remember thinking to myself, like, please just let me have my opening night. And if, if it all, (laughs) if it all comes crashing down after that, you know, know, Oh my, but just let me have my opening and, uh, whatever stars aligned and we actually got through the entire run, but it was, it was nerve wracking. Oh, I bet. I bet. I mean, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that about just let me have my opening (laughs) because with that, here we go. (laughs) From something of his penchant towards Fabian socialism. Yeah. I'm coming out swinging Mm. and exploring the Nietzschean concept of the Ubermensch. Mm. Playwright George Bernard Shaw wrote the play Man and Superman. Have you ever read this? I have not read. I mean, I've, I've, I know about as much of, about it as I know about Nietzsche and you know, <laughs> concept. Of, but I, I, I don't know the play at all, or okay, or even that George Bernard Shaw of all people wrote wrote it. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it's not exactly a page turner. I mean, I love Shaw and everything, but uh, he can get long winded. So, yeah, uh, it might have been easily forgotten if it was assigned at some point. Right. I do want to make sure my listeners and everybody understand. Don't get it mistaken. Shaw's Superman has nothing to do with Clark Kent's alter ego. Well, that's (laughs) color me shocked. (laughs) You mean he wrote it 30 years before the (laughs) character was invented? How could that be? Anyway, but rather the term Superman comes from the concept uh, that Nietzsche is basically accredited with of the evolution of man in society. So it's a character who possesses the following qualities, which I thought were best synthesized in an article I found on the play from thoughtco.com. Superior intellect, cunning and intuition, the ability to defy obsolete moral codes and has self-defined virtues. Mm. That's your Superman. Well, I'm going down the checklist and uh, (laughs) I'll I'll let you know when I've got a box to tick. There you go. (laughs) Now, the play Man and Superman is also a sarcastic response by Shaw to the person who ever suggested that he should write a Don Juan story. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he sure showed that person, I'm sure. Oh, yes, he did. So here's the synopsis of Man and Superman. 
The well-being and estate of wealthy heiress Miss Anne Whitefield are placed in the hands of two well-established men, John Tanner and Roebuck Ramsden. And I don't need to describe Ramsden too much. He's not really essential to the story. But let me describe John Tanner with this stunningly accurate description I found. Shaw's Jack Tanner is a modern-day Don Juan who has tired of womanizing and has begun questioning the purpose of life. Instead of settling for a wife, he is continually striving to become a superman, an idea devised from Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of the ubermensch, a man like Prometheus who, according to Greek mythology, defied the will of the gods by bringing fire to humanity. I mean, yeah, it's a pretty open-ended quest there. I feel like... <laughs> it's like jewels in Pulp Fiction, you know, he's just going to walk the earth. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what your, like, off-ramp is. From <laughs> yeah, where do you start? Uh, I don't know. John has published something of a manifesto called The Revolutionary's Handbook, something mm -hmm. that the conservative Roebuck Ramsden decries as blasphemy and throws in a trash bin in one scene, even though he's never read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Shaw actually wrote the full accompanying handbook to accompany the play in print, but told it through the eyes of his character, John Tanner. So he's like writing. Wait, through so he wrote the entire, like the prop? Yeah, the yeah. Because it's he knows it's going to be read in print. So he wants people to read the handbook to accompany the play, Man and Superman, so they could see what Roebuck Ramsden was getting all fired up about. And it's just full of Nietzschean ideas and how we can transcend this humanity we've created is this like when you're like watching a tv show or a movie and they show you a newspaper and you think about how someone had to write all of the <laughs> articles that are there for this <laughs> yeah for, for like, this one shot of the thing or <laughs> yeah and they're like i could just write gibberish no paul we need you to write a full story about no all Lawrence Gibson here <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so relating to don juan and the womanizing and chasing after you know whatever shaw makes the heiress Anne the pursuant seductress and john the prey so Ooh. kind of gender reversal role twist there. yeah realizing that in the early 20th century she can probably not advance in society without marrying and discovered that she also has romantic feelings for Tanner and makes her intentions known to be his wife. Mm. Having almost no respect for the institution of marriage, Tanner flees to Spain, but is closely pursued by Anne. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Changing countries is usually a pretty definitive no, if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Do you think he likes me? He went to Spain. Yeah. <laughs> and the play goes on like this for a while, Tanner fleeing and Anne pursuing. Now, the play is told in four acts, and the third act is really quite something. Tanner has a dream in which he becomes Don Juan and appears in hell and has a 75-minute debate with the devil on the meaning and purpose of life and a talkative statue. What is it with, like, people... <laughs> having dreams that I don't, my dreams are either so incredibly rote and mundane, you know, about like having, did it, did I like forget to where I put the car keys or something like that? <laughs> or, or at the other end of the spectrum, they are like just the most obscene things that we will not be talking about. Like <laughs> deep levels of subconscious stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff in the basement of the mind that only should ever be dredged out in dreams. Not a lot in between. I, I don't I don't see having a 75 minute debate with the devil. <laughs> and with, a talkative statue. And a talkative statue. Well, any statue, really. Like that's any statue. <laughs> a garden variety statue is not gonna <laughs> cut the mustard. Not even a lawn gnome. Uh <laughs> So, by the end of this 75-minute debate, John Tanner realizes that in order to create a Superman, he should marry Anne, as a Superman could be the result of their coupling. Now I'm starting to think that she did the whole Inception thing on him. <laughs> she planted the idea 
in this debate dream. <laughs> now the question is whether Chris Nolan stole from George Bernard Shaw or if George oh. Bernard Shaw uh, somehow retroactively stole from Chris Nolan. Div divined that there would be yes. a, an amazing film that people are still going, I'm sorry, what the hell happened? Yeah. Now, it took Shaw a year to write this play, and the third act is either often not performed with the rest of the play, or it's performed <laughs> separately as its own one-act offering. Or it's like the appendix. Yes. The, the Silmarillion mean... of, <laughs> of this play. The glossary at the end of Dune, where you're like, oh, that's what those mean. <laughs> now, in 1905, Man and Superman was staged in New York City. In response to the performance, Professor A. E. Bostwick of the New York Public Library removed the print version of Man and Superman from public collection in more than 30 branches and placed it in what is known as a closed stack. He claimed that consumption of the play would lead to higher rates of juvenile crime. Oh, I thought it was just because he found the 75-minute debate, like, exhausting. <laughs> this is so long. Nobody's going to return this in two weeks. Let's just cut ourselves with a problem here and <laughs> save ourselves the, the print effort and yep. the Dewey Decimal System and whatnot. Yeah, because where do we even put that? How many decimals do we need? It would seem that certain authorities in America did not see the play as a philosophical reflection on the evolution of man in society, but rather took offense to Tanner's anti-marriage sentiment and Shaw's Nietzschean tendencies. Hey, see, the, the things you described to me about the play, I don't know that I would have guessed that it was just because he, because he didn't approve of marriage. Oh yeah, that's that's such a very specific criticism to levy and to show that seems to have seems to dance around with all kinds of no, I, I don't know about questionable concepts yeah. per se. It's only for the time, <laughs> you know. Uh, even even just like the the one woman pursuing the man in the way she does was probably yeah, and and that was probably another complaint, but. Um... As we're going to find out, most of these kind of censorships happened when people did not read the play. Oh, that tracks. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I mean, so, you know, I also said that they were had a problem with the Nietzschean tendencies. Everybody knew this about Shaw. He was very open about his political beliefs and his philosophical mm -hmm. beliefs. And it was well known at the time that it was Nietzsche, after all, who said that God is dead mm -hmm. and that all organized religions are preventing man from evolving. Right. <laughs> I, I don't see why this would have been a problem in 1905. Yeah, we just came into the 20th century. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're like, wow, that's a big number. And that's yeah. uh, that's exciting for us. We we made it this far, gang. Good job. But that's America in the 20th century. They're only just a little over 100 years old at that point. In a New York Times editorial, Shaw responded to the book being hidden away from the public with something of a laugh. And here's a quote from his editorial. Nobody outside of America is likely to be in the least bit surprised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I love this. Calm stockery is the world's standing joke at the expense of the United States. Europe likes to hear of such things. It confirms the deep-seated conviction of the old world that America is a provincial place, a second-rate country town civilization after all. Wow. Yeah. You know, you don't get up after getting smacked down like that. <laughs> that that was just a brief section of this huge editorial that he wrote, Dan. It was obnoxiously long. But I mean, starting off with that. Yeah, that's that's a haymaker. And uh, I'm going to come back to the term calm stockery. Have you ever heard that before? I've not. I was no. going to I was going to loop back around to that, except I don't think I could even remember the word. <laughs> So uh, honestly, it sounds like a, a venture capitalist's dream. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're getting all your stocks into a calm stockery. I love it. Yeah. Well, actually, here's here's the meaning of the term. Uh, Shaw is credited to have coined the term calm stockery in another 1895 editorial. So 10 years earlier, this editorial was also to the New York Times, mocking one of America's most famous advocates for purity Anthony Comstock. Oh. 
Have you have you heard that name? I've heard the name. Oh my word! I, I'm just uh, I'm just impressed that he was using his own. I, I guess meme wouldn't be the word to describe it, but he was, <laughs> he was, he was making fetch happen. Yes, uh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. So let me let me tell you a little bit about Anthony Comstock, and this doesn't even paint hardly the full picture of how completely demented and awful this man was. <laughs> Anthony Comstock was a Civil War veteran who saw very little combat, but became better known for his penchant for removing what he considered to be obscene materials from American culture. Mm. And with the help of his local YMCA in New York City, Comstock formed the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Mm, Wow. (laughs) Lots of people in the story have like really broad aims for (laughs) things. The suppression of vice. It's like the war on terror. And I guess it's good to think big. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's good to have a lofty goal. You know, it's it's not like I'll take a I'll take my dog on a walk every day. You might miss some days, but you know, I mean, but the complete suppression of vice in general. (laughs) I mean, like that's right up there with killing God. (laughs) So. In the 1870s, Comstock went to Washington, D.C., fully funded by the YMCA, by the way, Mm. to pass a law that would remove obscene materials from public consumption by making illegal their delivery through the mail. Comstock pleaded with members of the House and Senate to pass a stronger anti-obscenity law that banned offensive newspapers, especially the ones that criticized him along with mention therein of contraception abortion from the mail. And here's a quote from his diary. All were very much excited and declared themselves ready to give me any law I might ask for, if only it was within the bounds of the Constitution. So I'm no constitutional scholar, and this is where I also play my hand that I'm actually Canadian. Right. Uh, (laughs) I've I've been living in America for, for quite some time now, but... I, I do, but there is an amendment, as I understand it, that uh-huh. mm-hmm. is, in theory, supposed to protect against. Uh, yeah, yeah. I want to say it's right near the top of the list. Okay, could be, well. Could be number one. I can't. So, I, I can, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, you want to know what else Comstock wrote in his diary? Uh, sure. Sure. Comstock also wrote in his diary that he was a shameful chronic masturbator. Why would you write that down? Like, what's the... I mean, Who, who's your audience? The <laughs> I just did an event for a post Civil War fort here, in which we kind of guided people through a storytelling a, a tour of living history, and one of our features of that was that women in frontier times were like encouraged and sometimes even felt like they were under order to keep a diary and a journal so that there could be these fantastic stories of the frontier that could be sold and published. And really all it did was say, everybody had dysentery and four of my five children died, but I still got one and she's got the shakes, you know? Right. (laughs) So, yeah. And when you think about like people writing diaries at that time, you, you just wonder. But even still, you know, like you, you you have a choice of what you put in there and what you don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I don't know for what posterity you're leaving the, you know, the 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 whatever scratch marks of like the number of <laughs> times you you yanked it today or <laughs> today I'm down to only seven. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I consider that improvement. So the Comstock Act was passed. In 1873. I, that's where I recognize the name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Comstock Act. The Comstock Act. Oh. Yeah, here we go. Comstock himself was appointed by the Postmaster General to enforce the Anti-Obscenity Act. He was given a free railroad pass for the entire nation so he could track down smut. He did it for a bus pass. <laughs> that's... That's what I my takeaway from here. I, I had a job in Seattle where I got a free bus pass. Yeah. I, well, I mean, yeah. that's I guess they learned it's one of the top incentives. <laughs> okay, so here's here's another thing that he wrote. I love this. The mail 
of the United States is the greatest thoroughfare of communication leading up into all our homes, schools, and colleges. It is the most powerful agent to assist this nefarious business because it goes everywhere and is secret. It surely needs no argument here to convince the most exacting of all decent men that no department of government should be prostituted to serve this infamous traffic, nor become party to it by continuing to serve these loathsome creatures after the character of their hellish business is known. Wow. <laughs> if only he could have seen the 21st century <laughs> and what the internet hath wrought. <laughs> well, I also think like, I. I think it was Mitch Hedberg who was like, I love the FedEx man. He's my drug delivery guy and doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? The internet. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, I have a friend who thinks that um, the like onslaught of young women who find themselves making tons of money on OnlyFans is going to leave horrific psychological scars on this country for years to come. <laughs> Did you <laughs> tell him about slavery or? <laughs> <laughs> if we want to talk about the psychological scars on the United States, I think OnlyFans is. It's a blip on the radar. Yeah. A lockdown, a lockdown, a lockdown, a lockdown. Now, Comstock was known for being absolutely ruthless in his pursuit to extinguish the obscene from public view. And he took pride in knowing that he was pretty much directly responsible for several people committing suicide because of his relentlessness. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, there are some horror stories like just this, this one woman who was trying to get free healthcare for women or something like that. And just, railed her in public and she eventually just slit her wrists because it wasn't worth it anymore he was his prototypical bully yeah yeah absolutely and was happy to know when things like this happened wow. awful awful man so he's been doing this for 30 40 years now He's been busting down doors and finding uh, awful things in bookstores. He even tried at some point to have certain anatomy books banned from medical schools. I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb and say this guy was not all well in the head. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, I'm, I know I'm doing like armchair psychiatry here, but I I think some people would just suggest that he's driven. Yeah. <laughs> Driven to write about his own masturbation in his diary. Uh -huh. uh huh. By finding all the smut. Yeah. And keeping it in secret locations. Anyway, so Man and Superman, 1905, is staged, and Comstock had nothing directly to do with it being restricted in the New York Public Library. But when George Bernard Shaw called him out in print and made fun of his name, Assuming that it was Comstock behind the whole incident because he'd been doing this for decades, Comstock then jumped into action. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Comstock first admitted that he had nothing to do with the censorship of the play or had even seen or read any of Shaw's plays. Consider me shocked. But... He was now happy to start the pursuit of having Man and Superman removed from libraries and bookstores as much as he could. Oh, Shaw. You naughty boy. You unleashed the Kraken. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, Comstock publicly denounced Shaw for his desire to display sins on stage for all to see, as he claimed the weak and poor would take Shaw's words seriously and cause untold damage to society. Oh, well, again... Society, I think, has already taken its lumps untold uh, <laughs> before Shaw ever got into the mix. But I mean, this is like reminiscent. I mean, you and I are around the same age, and I just remember uh, like gangster rap being denied so much because there was like talk about, hey, police might actually be hurting these these kids, and like we can't have that. And like, no, that's why they made the music in in, in a public forum so people could hear their side of the story. Uh, right. And then there's like two live crew who they're like, oh, these are awful and pornographic and terrible. It's like, well, they're speaking to their experience, I guess. So <laughs> feel free to view it as you choose. <laughs> now, 
The New York Times sided with Shaw and did everything it could to discredit Comstock in print, even though Comstock had a pretty devout following on his own. Theater Magazine sided with Comstock. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. <laughs> here's, here's their quote. Shaw was often too interested in setting the world on fire merely to see it burn. It's like the cow <laughs> siding with the butcher. <laughs> <laughs> Please take my parts. I, I mean, I, I listen to that and I think, you know, you're only like 10, 20 years away from, from Chekhov at this point, who frankly tells people, you know, the point of theater is not to solve problems, but rather to ask questions and show real life as it is so we can analyze it and then go away and go, what did I see in there that didn't please me? That's something we should maybe fix in this society, isn't it? <laughs> as far as I remember, that was fairly influential. But here we have people going, we don't want to see that stuff on stage to try to fix it. Yeah. Show me minstrel shows. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, Shaw just wanted to see the world burn. Here's the quote from the Chicago Tribune, who was also on Comstock side. Literary smut, even though it is the product of genius, is unfit for general reading. Wow. Smut is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that. Uh... <laughs> and I'm like a conversation where a man is like, I'm kind of anti-marriage because I don't see the benefit in it for me or my spouse or my potential spouse. And then having a debate about, you know, the purpose of life and going, oh, hey, make, maybe this will actually work out for me. He ended up getting married if you stayed to the end. I mean, you, you had to bring it back to the point of like, that's what this was all about in the first place, which just feels like such a tempest in a teapot to begin with. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like a mild disdain for marriage is it's like declaring <laughs> yourself to be a, a, a Nazi today. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Openly showing your hood to the world. Now, here's where things get interesting. In response to all this negative press, Arnold Daly, the producer and an actor, but he was the producer of the New York City production of Man and Superman. Arnold Daly announced that he would be launching a production of Shaw's play Mrs. Warren's Profession in New Haven, Connecticut, where he was from, in response to Comstock's objection to this. And then he was going to continue that production in New York City. So let me tell you why this would be a, a positive revenge tactic against Comstock in the court of public opinion. Mrs. Warren's profession centers around a woman whose mother has made considerable wealth. And in the second act, the mother reveals to her daughter that she did so through prostitution. Although no sex acts are seen on stage and they are barely referenced. I was wondering from the title if it might, in fact, be the oldest profession. Ah, ah, ah. And in the play, the men are seen as intellectually inferior to women, despite being the dominant gender in society. Mm -hmm. Shaw, with this play, was using theater to set up the ideas that as long as women existed in a capitalist society in which men were always going to be dominant, then prostitution would always be an economic option for women. I, I guess I haven't examined the argument to all of its uh, possible conclusions, but yeah, I'll buy that. Right, right. I mean, you know, we're we're in an age now where we're like, sex work is a thing. Right. You know, we talk about it in several different ways. I mean, burlesque shows, you have adult film stars, you have... Only fans. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Bring it back around. Yeah, so really in this play, we're saying that we see women actually using a capitalist society as something against itself to profit in many different ways. Uh, I mean, it's not even necessarily using it against itself so much as just using the system the way it was intended. Right. But now women are doing it. Right. <laughs> Same. Uh, well, I see, I see the economic demand and I can provide the supply. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And and nothing to say about, well, what part do men have in this? Because they're buying the prostitutes. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Just as promised, Arnold Daly opened a production of Mrs. Warren's Profession on October 27th, 1905, to a packed house in New Haven, Connecticut. Ooh. If we only took the word of the paper, 
the local paper as a collective reaction from the audience and some notable attendees, we would think that the play was, quote, vulgar. <laughs> I'm guessing there's more to this than, and, or you wouldn't have teed it up quite that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So John P. Studley, and I'm not making that name up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm filing that name away for future use, but go on. <laughs> John P. Studley, the mayor of New Haven, didn't see the play, but was quoted in the paper to say that the play was well acted and well written, but rotten. That's... I mean, that could be me with any number of productions. Uh, yeah, no, especially the part where I didn't actually go and see it. The mayor also said that he thought the play was grossly indecent and not fit for public presentation. And after one performance, Studley had the chief of police revoke the license for the play for any further performances in New Haven. Done. Comstock law in effect. This is the Barbara, Barbara Streisand effect. <laughs> Before Barbara Streisand was born. Before leaving New Haven, Arnold Daly was quoted to say, New York will stand for the play if New Haven will not. <laughs> so once Comstock heard of the incident in New Haven, he sent a letter to Daly warning him not to stage one of, quote, Bernard Shaw's filthy products the following Monday in New York, as was planned. <laughs> Daly responded with a letter inviting Comstock to dress rehearsal. <laughs> I feel like they, they obviously they didn't have the same constant flow of content that we have today, like with television oh God. And, and whatnot, but like <laughs> I, I would have been eating this drama up. Right. You know, if I, if I had been alive, then I, I would have tried my best to find my way in and be a, like, just add myself in as like another shit disturber in the pot here. Yep. Because, mm -hmm. This wasn't the last letter that was sent though, before the production opened. So yeah, I said Daly responded, inviting Comstock to the dress rehearsal. Comstock then responded with another letter stating that there would be no need for him to attend, reminding that when the play was produced in London two years prior, 1903, it was met with similar controversy and public chatter. Comstock went on to remind Daly that he could be arrested if he actually staged the play, citing that the Supreme Court in that district already avowed to uphold the Comstock law, as it has given authorities such power to arrest anyone they determined to be dealing with obscene materials. Comstock had no doubt that police chief William McAdoo would take care of business. Ooh, with a name like William McAdoo, you don't want to cross him. Don't you know who I am? I'm Bill McAdoo. Bill McAdoo is on the case again. Quick, there's been another Comstock violation. <laughs> Fire the McAdoo signal. <laughs> da -na 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 McAdoo. Daly responded with yet another letter to this threat of arrest, in which he explained to Comstock that he was way too busy to continue the conversation any further. <laughs> wow. What, a, what an age to be alive when you you have these like these arguments back and forth and it all has to be conducted by mail oh. uh, and to even to even to have to write the words I am too busy to argue with you over this and then <laughs> feel that in an envelope put a stamp on it uh, get it to your local post office or what have you <laughs> so here's here's what he said in his letter God I love this. Your quoting laws to me is useless, as I intend to break none. You are free to come on Monday night at box office prices to get the true message of the play if you are capable of receiving it. Truly yours, Arnold Daly. <laughs> this is all just reminding me of, uh, this, is, this is, I'm dating myself here, but uh, there, there was a thing called Usenet in the 90s, <laughs> early 2000s. And like the arguments that we nerds would get into, I say nerds, I, clearly myself, chief among them, just, just the same kind of, you know, sort of like dick wagging, <laughs> except without, uh, with the convenience of the internet and not having to spend money on paper stamps. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. I can just tweet my displeasure now. Now check this out. The weekend they were rehearsing to get ready for the performance in New York, police chief McAdoo obtained a copy of the script and basically went through it with a red pen, cutting Ooh. out lines that were not to be spoken. He sent the script to Daly with the message that if any of those lines were spoken, the company could be arrested. 
Ooh, wow. The company with, yep. from the lead actor down to the spot operator and mm -hmm. the box office manager who's taking the money and the tickets is like, you're, you're out, Tim. <laughs> now, Daly made the changes requested because he believed the message of the play was still intact, even with the edits. Mm. He furiously rehearsed with his cast for the next few nights until opening night. Ooh, here's a spooky thing. Monday, October 31st. Oh, no. No. I'm I'm more taken aback that they open a show on a Monday, but that's just me. That's yeah, that's uh, usually dark. It's absolutely dark. I think the only thing on Broadway that's open on uh, uh, on Monday is Wicked. And, yeah. and uh, apparently rightfully so by the name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, check this out. This show almost immediately sold out. And it's estimated that somewhere between 2,000 to 3,000 people were turned away at the door. Oh, wow. <laughs> Carriages could not even make it down the street in front of the Garrick Theater. And kids were noticed scalping tickets for floor seats. Wow. <laughs> Actors had to be escorted to the theater by cops swinging billy clubs. And here's our hero, Police Chief McAdoo. He attended the performance. Comstock did not. But apparently, Comstock did have two of his agents there who were basically ready to apply for arrest warrants upon the play's conclusion. Reporters noted that the House audience seemed to be evenly comprised of men and women, and it was noted that there were many young girls there. Oh, no. <laughs> the most vulnerable population of all. The one who might become whores! Yes. <laughs> A poll was placed with playbills for the audience to determine if the play was fit for public consumption or unfit. At the end of the night, the poll results were that 963 people attended the play, 576 voted, 304 voted for fit, and 272 voted for unfit. So, But what did the Fox News poll say? <laughs> they said it didn't even happen. Mm. <laughs> Arnold Daly responded to the multiple audience calls for a speech at the end of the performance and had this to say. Oh, boy. <laughs> if public opinion forces this theater to close and this play to be withdrawn, it will be a sad commentary indeed upon 20th century so-called civilization and our enlightened new country. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he might be overselling America there a little bit, but... Well, you know, it's his job to be dramatic, so. <laughs> Raise the stakes. Yes. <laughs> this play was scheduled to be run for a full week. Critics were somewhat divided. And uh, I didn't include it in here, but Daly said he would bow to public opinion. If the critics didn't like it, then he'd probably shut it down. But here's what happened. Critics were somewhat divided, claiming the play was quite lascivious in nature and that it often glorified immorality. One critic wrote the following. Arnold Daly has made a serious mistake. Mrs. Warren's profession, whatever its merits or demerits as a play for the closet, meaning you're only supposed to read it, or as an exposition of the author's views of, upon a sociological question, has absolutely no place in a theater before a mixed assemblage such as witnessed it at the Garrick last night. Can't please the critics, it seems. I guess not. And despite performing the play with the changes required by McAdoo, who said if you speak any of the lines, we're shutting it down, McAdoo nonetheless went to City Hall the next morning and reported to the mayor that the play must be closed, saying that the production was, quote, revolting, indecent, and nauseating where it was not boring. Now that sounds like uh, something I'd say about a play. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, okay, but so here's my question, though, because McAdoo already went through and like he he just used the red pen and he cut a ton of stuff from it. Yep. Mm -hmm. so the, was the play shorter? Was it tighter? He's complaining that it's boring. I mean, maybe he actually did the play a favor then by <laughs> making it shorter. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, having read a few of Shaw's plays and actually attending a couple of them, there's those people who will watch a movie and they go, you know, it could have been about 20 minutes shorter. Hmm. <laughs> and I, 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 right. I would say, you know, we could cut about an hour of this and probably have come to the same conclusion. It wouldn't have been as fun or funny, but, you know, nonetheless. Like maybe there's a market out there for the McAdoo cut, especially. 
especially with like our short attention spans that we all have today. <laughs> Would it have been as fun though? I don't know. Because those, I'm, I'm guessing those cuts were quite juicy. <laughs> so orders were made that the license for the play to be revoked and all future performances should be canceled. Arrest warrants were issued for the theater owner, the theater manager, all actors in the production, and for Arnold Daly. Wow, you know, that's actors already. They don't get paid much to begin with. (laughs) And I mean, honestly, they probably just answered the call. They're like, this is going to be my big break. Yeah, I know. And I got a New York City performance, mom. (laughs) What are you doing? You don't need to know. (laughs) I'm in production of a shadow cast production of Rocky Horror Picture Show right now. Uh And I'm directing it. And uh, most of my cast, I'm talking to them. And some of them, their parents are like, I really want to come see you on stage. You've never really done anything on stage. And they're like, no, mom, you don't want to see me in my underwear on stage. Can I tell you my favorite shadow cast line that I've, Ooh, please. Uh, I've seen in, mm-hmm. uh, in a shadow cast production of Rocky Horror? Because at the beginning of the movie, they're all like talking about like trying to get the phone and like gets the phone. and Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you we know, use your phone? Yeah. The line is castles, you know, castles don't have phones, asshole, is what everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But like that just kind of disappears and you forget about it. And my favorite shadow cast line uh, is that actually at the end of the movie. I know what you're going to say. What is, say. <laughs> when Riff Raff is saying, saying to them, you should leave now while it is still possible. And the, the line is, does this mean we don't get to use your phone? <laughs> Which I love because the story has just completely departed from anything at all relating to to what it was at the beginning and the, that callback to it. I remember the first time I heard it, I nearly died. Uh, I, I was laughing so hard at it. I, I'm sure it's really funny when I, you know, tell it all dissected like that. But. Oh my God. No, it's still funny. Like I inserted that a couple of years ago and it, it brought the house down. So, Oh God, <laughs> I love that. Can we use your phone? Um, okay. So back to the arrest warrants being made. Oh yeah. So we've got arrest warrants for uh, the theater owner, the theater manager, uh, Arnold Daly, and all actors in the production. However, the only person on site when the arresting officers showed up was the theater manager, Samuel Gumperts. (laughs) Wow. Names in the early 20th century were amazing. I know. How did I not know this? Comstock, Gumperts. (laughs) Gumperts was taken into custody, and this is crazy immediately into court. <laughs> it was such a high you say profile. immediately, you mean like dissolve, wipe, or... You know. <laughs> yeah, they, they lifted the curtain and there was the, the judge on the bench. Yeah. Gumperts declared that he was not guilty, so the case would then have to go to trial. When the case went to trial, this still blows my mind, when the case went to trial the next day, wow, it was determined that the play had not been performed since a cessation order had been carried out. None of the other warrants were carried out, so everyone was acquitted. But the arrest warrants would be reinstated if any further productions would continue. This is a a really good use of public money. (laughs) (laughs) Basically litigating these squabbles between (laughs) these parties. And And all it did was got a play canceled. Right. But now all of these actors have a warrant for their arrest on their on their record. But then again, we didn't have the internet back then, so a background check would probably take seven months. Right. <laughs> By this time, the box office of the Garrick Theater had sold they had sold thousands of tickets for the upcoming performances, but now all of them had to be refunded. Oh, the part of me that like has been on the business side of theater before. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, that's just that's the saddest thing to hear out of the entire story you've told so far. Not, you know, not the, the blatant censorship or anything like that. It's having to refund all those tickets. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's said that Arnold Daly invested $19,000 of his own money to get the production staged today. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of 600,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> to lose all of that cheddar. Oh my god. Oh my god. Uh, just because he wanted to put on some smut. 
Daly intended to submit his case to an appeals court as he still wasn't exactly sure what law he'd broken. It's <laughs> a fair, fair question. Right? <laughs> you know, really a, is, uh... you're, you're, you're done. You're done. For what? Shut up. Shut up. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word of Bill McAdoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and based on my research, I don't think Daly's appeal ever made it to court. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. The morning after the performance, Comstock was informed about the closure of the play and the arrests made. He is said to have responded with a chuckle. Uh, you know, who wouldn't <laughs> say it, have have a little evil chuckle banked up? Yeah, for right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you say my evil plans came to fruition just the way I'd intended them to. Oh, well, good morning to you too, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I've now decided that I am snooty and British. Uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Oh my gosh. I should show you a picture of Comstock. He has this mustache that looks like it weighs about seven pounds because oh. it's coming down in great sweeping arcs from his nostrils. Everything else on his face is shaven clean. I love it. So yeah. he's, it's more the transatlantic voice probably than like that. <laughs> oh, I see, well, I see my plans have been executed exactly according to the way I specified them. The Comstock Act once again has succeeded. <laughs> oh, Comstock. <laughs> Comstock at your service. Yes. Comstock out. <laughs> <laughs> now, in print... Mrs. Warren's profession is often accompanied by a lengthy essay from Shaw titled The Author's Apology. Oh, my gosh. In it, he offers basically no apologies, <laughs> <laughs> but rather takes great amusement in the idea that his plays are the things that can stir critics and other moral crusaders into believing that he is the pinnacle of iconoclasm. He invented clickbait. <laughs> so ahead of his time. Ah, what's this? I see Shaw has issued an apology. <laughs> ah, finally, Comstock's day has arrived. Get McAdoo on the line. We'll read it together. <laughs> okay, here's, here's, here's where I'm going to end this. This is a quote from Shaw's incredibly lengthy thing. I started to read it and I just went, "You, oh my God. All of this is very useful, but my God. Just wrap it up, buddy. <laughs> wrap it up. Okay. Do not suppose, however, that the consternation of the press reflects any consternation among the general public. Anybody can upset theater critics in a turn of the wrist by substituting for the romantic commonplaces of the stage the moral comp commonplaces of the pulpit, platform, or the library. Nowadays, they no longer believe in hell, and the girls among them who are working know that they do not believe in it and would laugh at them if they did. Mm. And that is the story of Comstockery wow. and the banning of Mrs. Warren's profession. I, I love that I've I've grown my lexicon today. Uh, there we go. Comstockery is uh, the my going to be my new epith epithet that I sling when I feel I've been wronged, which is a lot. <laughs> so, out of context, I got an email from the box office manager, the, the theater where we're putting on the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I understand people might have questions about it because they did put a disclaimer on it. It's for mature audiences. Mm -hmm. And so somebody wrote in and they said, so what makes it mature? And that was about the extent of the email. So I'm, I'm in, envisioning several people. I'm envisioning somebody who would be readily offended and wanting to protest. Or I'm imagining a guy in a very poorly lit room going, what makes it dirty? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about this maturity. <laughs> so the box office manager wrote me and said, what do I tell him? I said, well, okay, the, the show itself is very sexual and adult in nature, but it doesn't have a lot of profanity to it. That's provided by the audience. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let him know that. <laughs> But we've said it on this show a few times that so much has been done to try to protect the innocence of an already not innocent world mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, in the in the search for public propriety, we just keep tripping ourselves up and 
kind of going backwards and then ending up at the same place anyway. At the same time, the pendulum has, I think, swung. Oh my word! Mercifully, in the you know, in the direction of liberalism. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Certainly in my lifetime, uh, I, I'm I'm certainly grateful for that. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, there's always go- going to be that puritanical. I believe uh-huh. that's the word. Uh, that puritanical streak running through, you know, American culture especially. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and I, you know, I'm not here advocating that all content should be available to all people. You know, I mean, you're a parent. I'm a parent. You know, I, I tell my kids, you know, I am, I do this Rocky Horror Picture Show because there is kind of a need for it in this in this world because there are people wanting that kind of thing and they will pay money to see it and they enjoy it and they have a great time and they feel comfortable there. But I say, but you're not going to see it. <laughs> and they're like, why? And I play some music and they're like, this is great. And I'm like, yeah, but it gets into things about consent and and uh you know uh, self sexual exploration and self exploration and gender identity and all this stuff and i'm like you know i we can have those conversations but uh you know maybe right now you're not 100% psychologically equipped to handle those kind of questions yeah i mean you've thought it through a lot more lucidly than i have <laughs> uh, and i congratulate you for that certainly as as a parent I want to protect my child, uh, well, my children, I should say. My, yeah. I think more because one of my, ch- uh, one of my children is uh, seven and the other one is uh, still only one. I think more about the seven-year-old than I do the one-year-old in terms of, you know, what is she being exposed to that, you know, maybe she's not ready for or not equipped to understand yet. But at, at the same time, I uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm just not that good of a parent, but <laughs> I, I doubt that. I've seen your Facebook; it's adorable. Oh, oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but but I also, you know, I I feel like for most things she'll be fine. You yeah. know, like there's we, we as a species have survived for as long as we have, and. You know, human life is so short already. When you think about all of the generations of people who had to uh, raise their children and then those children had to raise their children for for it to eventually get to where we are. Odds favor survival, you know, of, <laughs> of whatever of whatever naughty thing she might happen to see or be exposed to or whatnot. Yep. 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 You know, maybe, maybe I maybe I'm just a gambling man. <laughs> Well, I think you're right, though. I mean, when you look at it, like you could expose somebody to some something that maybe the most of us would say that's kind of illicit. And most kids would just be like, whoa, I saw that. And then there might be some who they take that a little too seriously and they they start to think about it in harmful ways. But it's I think you're right. The numbers don't suggest that it's going to be a general situation. Well, and I wonder in the times when it is. A, an actual situation, yeah, I, and this is not to dispute that there certainly are bad and abusive scenarios that oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, occur with all of this stuff. But at the same time, uh, I think there are also scenarios where the problem as much might be the parent who's keeping a secret diary about how many times they masturbate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as, it is, <laughs> as it is on the child. I touch myself too much because there's smut in the world. I will end all the smut. <laughs> oh, wait, we got to do the mid-Atlantic. Okay, yeah. All I will right. end all the smut, see? <laughs> any, yes. any smut <laughs> comes before me, I'll get it with my tummy gun. <laughs> God, we're going like 20 years ahead now. Can't afford to be historically accurate when there's smut. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just... Stay the course, despite mortality. Sorry, you were you were trying to wrap up. I yeah, think, I think I was trying to wrap up. Work. That was just a fantastic exploration of a really, really silly event in theater history. It is, and that's the th- it is just so <laughs> patently silly. Everyone involved is behaving so silly. Yeah, and <laughs> it's, it's all just so childish and immature, which I find delightful, but. <laughs> there, there's also delightful and a, a little bit sad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're like, oh, it's too bad you take yourself so seriously. Exactly. Maybe you should masturbate some more. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a diary. A lockdown, a lockdown, a lockdown, a lockdown. Hey friends, this is your host, Aaron Odom, coming at you again. I want to thank you for listening to today's episode. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us a review wherever you pick this podcast up. Or go ahead and like, share, subscribe, all the cool stuff you do with podcasts. We are Trident Theater. That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, www.tridenttheater.com. Once again, this is Aaron Odom. Them, and we try to get a new episode out every two weeks, so hope to see you again in a fortnight. Good.